What is going on, y'all? Welcome to episode three of the Half Price Concessions podcast. Today, we raise the debate. Which side of racing does crown jewel events better? Is it asphalt racing or is it dirt racing? I'll be representing the asphalt side, but Buddy Payne, one of my best friends, will hold it down on the dirt side and we will have a nice, calm, adult-like debate without no hot takes or no craziness and no cuss words being said. Me and Buddy Payne sitting down to hammer this one out and we'll throw in some fun along the way afterwards. But episode three of the Half Price Concessions podcast coming your way in just a few moments. Hey guys, have you heard about Anchor? Well, you should. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. First and foremost, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your cell phone or your computer. Anchor will even distribute your podcast for you. It takes all the work out of it. Your podcast can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Just download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Episode three of the Half Price Concessions podcast, and I finally have tracked down Buddy Payne, the guy that this was supposed to be with. But you know what? A lot there's things more important than podcasting, like being a married man and your career that pays you bills. But Buddy, I'm glad we finally tracked you down to finally have this conversation. And you even had to work today. We're recording this on Sunday. So, do you ever get a day off in heating and air conditioning? <laughs> Honestly, it's it's a twenty four seven gig, that's for sure. But um, I'm sure I could, but I do so much other work as well. It's, it's, it's always something to do, honestly, but yeah, it's a fun job. We get to help folks out and, but it's a high demand job. It ain't cut out for everybody. That's for sure. I figured it's like being an auto mechanic. You're never off duty. Cause someone can call you on the phone oh, yes. and be like, my unit's doing this or my unit's doing that. So well, you have your regular customers and you got your friends of a friend and relatives you didn't know you had until the AC quits working. So the phone always rings, that's for sure. Absolutely. Well, we're, what's inspiring today's main topic, and we got others we might get to as well, but is kind of crown jewel racing that's not NASCAR or IndyCar, stuff like that. And you're the guy who exposed me to dirt. You've been a dirt fan your whole life, dirt lay model racing to be more specific, but we might throw in some other ones as well. I kind of stayed a little more asphalt, but I'm not as plugged in as I used to be. And with this coming weekend, Martinsville's big late model race is coming up. It's normally it's 25,000 to win. I think it's 32,000 to win this year, but it's always kind of been the biggest one in this region. I'm old enough to remember when they did two of these a year, they used to do uh, the dogwood and the springwood, you know, whatever it was, there was a spring race and a fall race right. and it'd be 110, 115 cars. And it was, you know, it was just crazy, you know, and South Boston had a big race, Motor Mile or New River Valley, Orange County used to have one, A Speedway had a Labor Day one that they used to do every year. Right. So around here, it seemed like as far as asphalt stuff, there was, there was quite a few in this area. As far as dirt goes in this area, I don't, I don't know of any crown jewels in the North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia area, other than if you want to throw in some of the big shows at Jamaica, but I think on dirt, it seems like they're either Midwest or somewhere else. They're not in this area. The the handful of crown jewels that were attempted, I guess you can say, for we'll just stick with North Carolina alone. Um, when Charlotte, when they built the, the big dirt track down there, um, they ran a, a race called the Colossal 100 uh, several years. Um, I'd say maybe three to five years span. Um, and much like other you know new uh, big races like that, first year, car count's great. You know, things, you know, you have a big turnout, big crowd and whatnot. And then, you know, just as the years go on, for whatever reason, it just doesn't catch on, which is crazy because we're so, you know, dirt late, late model heavy in this region and especially being in Charlotte. So, you know, you're pulling from South Carolina, Georgia, you know, kind of the hotbed um, around here for late model racing. Um, but as far as our local tracks, um, again, it's just a thing, you know, they've tried it, just never really panned out. Uh, Fayetteville's really pushing this uh, first in flight 
uh, 100. Um, they got bit by weather this year, but last year, you know, it's 25,000 to win and you had only 30 cars show up for whatever reason, you know, you can blame, you know, track or whatever, but it hasn't been for a lack of effort. That's for sure. Um, I think, you know, not to jump topics, but with crown jewels, I think there's, there's tiers of crown jewels and yeah. for the dirt stuff, you know, you have, I like to call them the local crown jewels. So like Cherokee, you know, it's right there on the border, North Carolina, South Carolina. You've got the blue gray, um, it's been around for years. You've had, you know, the March Madness has been around for 15 plus years now and that's a crown jewel for them, but you, you might get one or two tour guys, but nobody from, you know, Iowa's coming down to run that race. Yeah. Uh, Jamaica, you know, like I said, you got the USA 100, you got the Commonwealth uh, 100 up there, and it'll pull, you know, maybe 35 supers or so, and it's a big pain race, 20,000 to win and all, but, you know, that's kind of that second tier yeah. uh, local crown jewels, I like to call them. I, I would, I'd say the same with this asphalt stuff, because I've, I've got a full list of them, but I'd probably, I could definitely tear it down, and when I think of asphalt racing crown jewels, the, the first main ones that come to mind for me was, of course, the Martinsville Lake Model Race, sure. um, and then uh, the Snowball Derby, yep. which is actually a super, what we call in this area super late model racing as far as like my big two just right off the bat. And therein lies my first kind of, I don't want to say criticism, but kind of note when you're talking about asphalt crown jewel races, you have to break them up between supers and late models because in asphalt racing, we don't all call a late model the same thing. Right. If you're in Virginia, North Carolina, or South Carolina, a late model is a peri what we call a perimeter chassis. It is a heavier. It's not lean to the left. It's it's a little more bounce. It's, it's from what the drivers say, it's a tougher thing to drive. Bubba Pollard attests to that. And then the rest of the country calls a late model what we call a super, a, a left-hander chassis. It's it's a straight rail. It's lean to the left. Uh, it turns better. It's got more horsepower. And they have more higher paying races. And I think that's one part the dirt gets right that asphalt gets wrong is a late model crown jewel race in Iowa is the same kind of late model that's running at Eldora. Yeah. So that's that's one kind of criticism I would have to have on my end. Sure. Um, and that's the the thing with, with the dirt late model stuff is there's, you know, several sanctioning bodies and very, very minor differences uh, with the rules. So, you know, you can take a guy that runs Lucas Oil and he can make very minor changes and go run World Outlaws or make minor changes and, you know, go run an ultimate race or, or a clash race or something like that. The, but we're talking very minor things, and it may be something from a droop rule um, to, you know, your wing pitch, you know, spoiler, whatever. But Seems for, like now it's more the aerodynamics. aerodynamics. I, I see a lot of it's like, all right, we're going to let your sail panel be this big right. on the back end. That seems to be the and, main thing they're getting them on now. Well, tire, tires is the big thing, I would say, probably, is, you know, the, this class only lets you run American Racer. This one, you know, run Hoosier. But as far as the car itself, you know, they're all running the same engine. Uh, they don't have to make any modifications to the engine. Um, and for the most part, you know, your chassis are pretty, you know, interchangeable there between the different sanctioning bodies. Uh, weight is usually about the same, but I mean, the stark difference in late model racing is, is the engine crate, the super, you know, an open motor versus a crate motor. Um, and, and crates have their, you know, they're starting to grow with their crown jewels, if you want to call them, or just bigger money races. Uh, but yes, compared to the, the asphalt stuff, I think it's a lot more uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Here's here's one I have for you, just because I did not come from the dirt background. I know there was that time, I don't know if it was the 80s or the 70s, when the wedges right. kind of come in. Was there, from what you know, was there kind of a split between guys running wedges and then like races that were like for those non-wedge cars or was it just everybody was doing the wedges uh, as well, far as the bodies go? It, it really depends on what the sanctioning body wanted i guess or, or what what they were allowing because the wedge the wedge cars had a very large advantage over you know what was then uh what was considered late model was i guess we would halfway classify that as like the old timers like you know yeah. it's a it's a modified uh you know sportsman style body you know they just cut the fenders off put bigger fender wheels on you know things like that you know the engines are obviously got more power and whatnot but um, yeah, when the wedge car stuff uh, first came out, I think it really started growing popularity around in the early 80s. Um, 
with the advantages that they had, they were just faster, they were lighter, uh, handled better. You know, most guys knew if I'm going to compete, I have to run this car. Um, and then, it just looked like a race car. It, it, it was a purpose, <laughs> it, it was more of a purpose built car versus, you know, the old school, go to the junkyard, knock the fenders off, put a roll cage in, let's go racing. Um, we had the wedge car stuff. Um, and then th they didn't, they didn't really have a good rule book though. So that like the mid eighties, man, you can see some crazy designs with all the, the panels and stuff. These guys are running to get all the downforce and whatnot. And then really I'd say early to mid nineties is when they really got a good rule book and then everybody kind of copycatted that and then it's grown to what we have today. Yeah. As far as we'll name off a few of these kind of crown jewels, I've named off two of mine, Martinsville late model, snowball derby. Uh, there's Oxford 250 up in Maine. There's the Winchester 400, the All-American 400 at Nashville. And those are mostly the super ones, some of the asphalt ones. There's Bobby Isaac Memorial at Hickory, the Myrtle Beach Race, the Hampton Heat is starting to get there. As far as the dirt stuff, I know you said you have them in tiers, but if you right. had to narrow down kind of your top crown jewels on dirt, what would be kind of your handful you put in that basket? I think if you were just to ask a Dirt Lake Mall fan – when you hear the word crown jewel, what's the first thing you think of? I think nine out of ten of them would say the World 100. You know, yeah. that's, that's, it's called the granddaddy of them all. You know, it's been around for 49 years. Uh, the purse grows every single year. Um, and I've of all the interviews I've ever heard, every single driver says that's the one I want to win, which is kind of crazy because there's better paying races um, out there, but yeah, the dream at the same time pays way more and they'll pull 25 less cars, you know, and that's just, it's crazy. And that's where I think you really have to define what crown jewel is. Um, but just all, alpha, the term alone, when you say crown jewel, I think world 100 is the first one to, that jumps out. Um, and then, you know, you have, uh, the dream, uh, the Knoxville late model nationals are up there. Uh, show me 100. That's a, that's a pretty big one. Um, that's that's still pulling out of cars and the dirt track world championship um that's one that's bounced around that's one of the, the rare ones that's bounced around from different tracks but the prestige is still there and and it'll still pull you know a slew of cars you know 70 plus um and now it's paying 100,000 win forever it paid 50 and now it's up to 100,000 win so um i, I if, if you like had to say the top two i'd say probably World 100 most definitely, and then probably Dirt Track World Championship is probably the second biggest one. The other thing that sticks out to me when we're talking about these two levels of racing is when we're talking on the dirt side, we are talking about the highest level of that sport. Those guys that are doing it for a living, not, not all of them can, but a, a chunk of them are doing it for a living. Whereas on my asphalt side, especially for the late model stuff, most of them are, if they've got money behind them, they're trying to get on the to cup. Sure. Where their crown jewels were, Daytona 500, a Southern 500, and all those. But now that has become so, I hate to say unattainable, but I mean, if you ain't got a lot of money behind right. you, it, it feels terribly unattainable. Sure. Whereas some of these asphalt super guys, you know, a lot of those, like the Bubba Pollard, the Casey Rodericks, um, Jeff Choquette, Stephen Nancy, those guys, they don't seem like they're going up on they're they're kind of at that higher echelon of asphalt super racing and i don't i don't think other than bubba i don't know how many of them are doing it for a living but it's not as many as like the dirt guys so i think that that makes some difference because those dirt guys like your scott bloomquist your davenports and them that's their job All right All right absolutely and that's so you know that's why they're running you know 90 some races a year some of them out there you know, if there's a race this weekend and and, and my, my tour race got rained out, if there's something within driving range that pays 5000 more to win, then, you know, they'll show up. Um, and I think that that really bodes well with the fans because it still has that old school, you know, blue collar, I'm working. Even, you know, they're driving a race car. It's hard to think about that as work. But, you know, they're working for a living, you know, um, and they have to compete and they have to, you know, knock off some top tens and top fives, you know, to make enough money to make it if you don't have the sponsorship behind you. Um, and and you're you're seeing it more, and I guess it would be more from the sprint car side of things, but there are have been some dirt late model guys here recently, the young guys, who are using that as a stepping stone. But I would say for the most part, you know, guys see – you know, super late model racing on dirt or uh, even, you know, 410 sprint car racing um, as, um, 
you know, the top level for them. You know, they enjoy it more. You know, they're not going to make as much money as the NASCAR guys or, or IndyCar, obviously. But, you know, you've had like Tyler Reddick, you know, he, he comes in the dirt late mile racing, runs for three years, signs with arguably, you know, the best guy out there with uh, Bloomquist, learns so much about car control and how to maintain a car and uh, how to drive a tight race car, you know, things like that. And, you know, look at him now, he's, he's winning Xfinity, you know, championships and stuff like that and competing. Um, then sprint car side, you know, you got your guys like, you know, your Larson and Stenhouse and whatnot, and that they've used it to pole vault. But I think what I've seen here recently is, you know, guys get to that upper echelon. And it takes a lot of work to get to where you can compete. And it still um, takes money to get up there. It takes, it's, 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 it takes it's money, not, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, Just and not as much as it takes to run NASCAR. That's, that's right, <laughs> that's right. But once once they get there, A, a it's it's challenging enough and they're making enough money that they're they're content. Or B, they do make that next step up, and then they realize I was having a whole lot more fun down there, and I was making a living. And you know, you're starting to see some guys kind of trickle back down into that. Um, Brian Clawson had a great quote about that. The late Brian Clawson, who ran hundred something shows a year, was trying to run two hundred a year. He passed. Right. Where he said, "There's other levels of racing that pay more money that aren't, but aren't as fun." And he was out there. He was running a midget car for a living. And I've, I've heard guys from like Indiana and stuff that run the midgets that run it on a local ish level. They don't, they don't go further than two and a half, three hours from the house. And even there, there is, it's, it's getting harder, sure. but they're finding a way to make a living at yeah. it. Whereas asphalt, you'd be hard pressed to find an asphalt late model stock driver who makes a living doing it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's, yeah. it's not, it's not there no more. Like it might've ish could have been. I know, Around here, Todd Massey did it for a while, but he was driving for Westcott. Sure. So it's just, yeah. it, it's just not there like it is on the dirt side. Yeah, if you got someone footing the bill, you know, no matter what type of race, you know, <laughs> that that definitely plays a, a big role into it. But um, I think now there's so many um, big races. You know, they're not crown jewels, but there's so many big races. You can you can go you know anywhere really within two or three hours on any given weekend and run for ten grand. You know, that's that that's unheard of. You know, ten years ago, um, just about every weekend um, from I'd say May till really to throughout the end of the year, there's a twenty thousand to win race somewhere. Um, so if you're competitive, you know you can you can definitely make a living at it. That's for sure. Yeah, I think it'd be a good chance to now kind of look at some of the pros and cons from from both sides of our not really an argument, but I mean just kind of what we grew up in. You're sure. you're the dirt guy. I'm I'm a little more the asphalt guy. And for me, the pros on the asphalt side are there's starting to be some more of of these shows coming out. Uh, Chris Ragel and the Cars Tour did the 30,000 to win uh, Old North State Nationals at Orange County. Uh, this year, they're going to do it again next year. And I feel like, I think, number one, they wanted to give guys another option other than Martinsville in this area to run. And the Hampton Heat at Langley Speedway is 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 getting bigger every year. Myrtle Beach still runs. Hickory still runs Bobby Isaac Memorial, and on the on the super side, you know, there's there's a lot of variation. My my two my cons on the asphalt side, as far as crown jewels are, number one, for the money it pays, a lot of them are you know two three day shows. That money adds up on you know pit passes and gas and tires and stuff. I'm not a big multi day show guy. I understand some events it has to have it, but I love the one day format. I like it as a fan. I also like it for the boys in the pits that, you know, they work full time jobs. They got families and stuff. I'm sure they'd rather just have one day, but I understand the side of it where, uh, it has to be more than one day, but uh, you know, snowball derby, I think they're down there for the whole week. Another pro I actually, I meant to add this sooner was something they do with the snowball derby is, the race is so long you have to have pit stops. Well, Snowball Derby does, I think it's called like a controlled pit stop where the guys come down pit road and no matter how slow their pit stop is, they're going to come out the way they came in. That's to keep them from hiring high dollar pit crews and all this stuff and spending more unnecessary money, you know, and they can still retain position on the track. But my main drag on asphalt, Crown Jewel Racing, they are so long. <laughs> the race is so long. and the, But the problem is... A lot of these asphalt fans feel cheated right. if the race ain't 200 laps. And I'm sitting there like, they're riding for 175. <laughs> exactly. I hate, I, I, I hate's a strong word. 
the it's such a long race. Martinsville now breaks it up with two competition cautions, but it's such a long race. That's those would be my cons on the asphalt side. Okay. Um, Dirt, where would you spin? Um, well, I'll just kind of piggyback off of your pros and cons there. For the dirt stuff, especially your bigger crown jewels like your Eldors and whatnot, um, the multi-day show is actually a benefit for them because unlike your asphalt guys who are at the track at 8 o'clock in the morning, they get you know probably an hour plus of practice and stuff, and that track outside of temperatures not really gonna, and a little bit of rubber ain't going to change much. A dirt guy on a typical night, he gets three hot laps, two qualifying laps, uh, you know, eight to ten laps in the heat race, and then runs out for 50 laps. I mean, your asphalt guys are getting that many laps in, you know, in practice, you know, and that track's the same. But there's so many variables in the dirt stuff, they need as much track time as possible. Uh, so that's one benefit to having the multi-day shows. Um, and then B, you know, for me personally, I like to travel and go to these shows. You know, it, it's a hard thing for me to say, I'm going to go to Eldor if it's a one day show, but if it's a three day show, you know, take a couple days off work, make a weekend out of, you know, it's a vacation. Um, so you get to enjoy it more, but also for the driver's benefits now, you know, we'll just, we'll stick with Eldor, you know, Thursday night, you got, they split the field up in two and they're running 25 laps for 10 grand the win on Thursday night, then you do it all over again Friday night, and then, you know, your main show's on Saturday. So if you just make the show each night, you're only making enough money to pay for your way going. So it gives your guys who aren't, you know, the top-tier tour guys a chance to at least go have the experience, make some money, and you, you never know what's going to happen in a race. You know, somebody blows a tire or, or whatever, or you get a good pill draw, you can make the show, and, you know, if you sneak in the top 10, top 15, you made some good money that weekend. So I think the multi-day shows are good. I think for certain shows, you know, if it's your big, bigger shows that's pulling, you know, 60 plus cars and you need to split that field up and you're going to have B mains and stuff, then it makes a lot of sense. Um, the cons for the, for the crown jewels really on the dirt side is with there's so many big paying races guys who are trying too hard you know they're pushing too much to try to drag the show out to a two-day show um or a three-day show you know when it's not needed um like if it's I mean, under if it's 20 grand and under right does it really need to be more than a one-day show well my thing is if you're pulling if if it's a, a race that historically brings 30 cars we don't need to run you know friday night qualifying and heat races and then you got six cars in the b main for saturday you know that's yeah. that's not enough of a of, of a draw for the fans and, and and really you already know who's gonna make the show and it's kind of boring like you said you know with the time thing and whatnot um and really my biggest pet peeve when it comes to crown jewels on dirt late model racing and even though it's changing some now but it's still too much of a standard is they they add money to it which is great but it's all on the top they just took this fifty thousand win race and made it a hundred thousand win but it's still paying a thousand start you yeah. know so your your winner is yeah he's happy about it but you know you got it finishing you know 15th 16th he's still making the same show you know the same money um i really like the format and i think they're on the right track um with this dirt million that they're in at mansfield as far as splitting it up throughout the field so your winner's still going to take home one heck of a payday but you got to finish his dead last this year made almost four grand yeah. you know you'd have to win you know a carolina clash or an ultimate race down at fable this weekend for four grand um so i would really like to see I, I'm glad the money's there. It's it's a healthy it's, the sport's very healthy right now, and it has a very bright future, and there's a ton of you know potential there. But I really like to see this money divvied out throughout the field. Um, I, I guess this is a pro and a con again, with depending on car count. I'm really starting to like these uh, qualifying features. Um, uh, Fairbury's doing this, um, and I believe um, it was a race this weekend. Uh, Might have been a clash at the Mag. Where instead of you know doing your heat race and stuff, they qualify and then they split the field and you run like a twenty five lap like a mini feature. Yeah. So you're out there and it makes for great racing because you know guys ain't, ain't conserving fuel and tires and stuff and they can burn it down and puts on a great show and and that sets up where you start the next night. So guys are trying and then B you know you're winning twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah. You're not uh, for, just winning placement in a feature to come exactly. in the future. You're, exactly. you're getting a reward for your effort now, <clears throat> as opposed to down the road. And you're not, you know, you're not, you know, having to appeal draw screw you, you know, from from your hard work. So, um, I guess to summarize that, the the pros, I do like the multi day shows for the big when it's a big car count. 
Um, and, and it just benefits everybody. Tracks make more money. Fans are enjoying more. The drivers have the potential to make more money. Um, and then I guess uh, my biggest con is just where, how that money is being divided in the payoff purse. Here's, here's one. Do you like the passing points format? That's that's one you see yeah. a lot more in dirt than you see. I don't know of, of any of these crown jewels on asphalt that use the passing points format because asphalt guys would blow their lid. Asphalt guys, <laughs> they want to start where they qualified and they do not. This is asphalt culture is just not one where they want a heat race. It's just not, you know. And I I used to I used to bang on them a lot more, but now I'm just like you know what? It's just a different. It's a whole different culture. Right. Whereas as dirt guys are used to. Heat racing and stuff, but then you get the passing points, right. and you get the big some of the big ones that don't like it. I remember Shane Clanton at Arizona one year; he he flipped his car over, I think, in his heat race, and they were dumb enough to shove the microphone in his face after the man tore his car up. And of course, Shane reacts with emotion, and I think says, "Expletive these passing points." <laughs> yes. I mean, he was upset. Yes. Well, what um, do you think? Well, this year, uh, I-80 is a great example. They were one of the first tracks to start doing that uh, for the Silver Dollar Nationals. Uh, pays uh, 53000 to win. You know, big money race. Uh, and, you know, arguably the top guy in the nation right now, Jonathan Davenport, you know, he kind of um, lit a fire into some folks. Uh, definitely drew a reaction about his complaint about the passing points because if you have just one, you get behind, you know, one guy that just doesn't, is inexperienced or somebody has, you know, an issue in front of you, you get caught up in it and you're the, you know, point leader, you're the top guy and probably, you know, the heavy favorite to win it. Well, now your weekend's, you know, pretty much shot and you're coming from the back. Um, I think it, it only works on certain tracks. It has to be a big enough track and a wide enough track to where if, you know, your fastest guy is starting you know, on the tail end of the field, he has a way to get around the slower guys without tearing his stuff up. But on tight tracks and, you know, tracks that just don't produce a lot of passing, I think it's it's – I know they're trying to make it exciting for the fans, but I mean, you really have to do take in the guys who are behind the wheel on it. I'm personally not a fan of it. I've never been a fan of penalizing somebody for being good. You know, if a guy comes out there and he lays down a good qualifying lap, uh, he should start on the front row of his heat race. Uh, if you want to do, you know, uh, a redraw of some sort, you know, I think four positions is max. Uh, but you don't need to penalize a guy for working hard and having good setups and putting in the time and effort to be good. I, I think the one that gets it the best is more about lost sprint cars because you heat race how you qualified and then you top depending on how many cars show up your top two or three from each heat go to the dash which is another race to line up the top six or eight for the main event so like you said you're not getting penalized for showing up and laying down a good qualifying lap and you run good in your heat race you're going to redraw for your uh, start position in the dash, but the worst you're going to start in the feature, even if you don't present the car for competition, is sixth or eighth on most of these shows. I, right. I feel like they get it right on that one. They do, and, and it's kind of contradictory. You know, in my opinion, dirt racing in general, the biggest race is the sprint car, not show nationals. 150,000 win. That's the birthplace of, well, it's the home of sprint cars, not the birthplace, but. That is a tough show that, to make. That is a tough show to make. <laughs> and their their inverts are ridiculous. Uh, I mean, they, they have the qualifying nights and whatnot. And if you qualify on the pole, it's an eight invert in your heat race. And it's only, I think, an eight lap, maybe a 10 lap heat race. So you're not going to make it through on the transfer there. And they do all the passing points and stuff. But $180,000 to win. You know, we'll let that one slide. But, yeah, on the nor normal circumstances, yeah, a dash or something like that, if you want to just promote some more racing and, and have that faster guy behind some of the slightly slower cars so the fans, you know, can see some, some action, that that's okay. But there there has to be a happy medium there for sure. Here's here's another one I thought of on the way down here. And I bet we'll probably take both sides on this position. I know on the dirt side, a lot of these crown jewels now have – gone to sanctioning they're either world outlaw mm -hmm. shows or the lucas oil shows mm -hmm. um i'm sure on the sprint car side more of them now are world of outlaw sanctioned on the sprint car side on the asphalt side i know there's some sanctioning but it doesn't quite seem as crazy a lot of them a lot of them are into year shows and then some of the other ones are just you know they're they're officiated under certain rules whereas on the dirt side it's like more the sanctioning is creeping more into it mm -hmm. And I understand them doing it because a lot of these tracks, number one, for a crown jewel race, you got to have the staff mm -hmm. to officiate these races. And you, it's not just Bubba in the tower lining them up. 
uh, Bubba Jr. on the race director and you know, Bubba the third down there in the pits lining them up. It takes a lot of staff to to just work these events. So I understand why a lot of these events have gone to sanctionings because the sanctioning body brings the pretty much enough officials to get it done. But part of me doesn't like to see it just because like like say Jonathan Davenport goes to let's think of, let me think of one on the Lucas Oil side that's a crown jewel. Would you would you call it North South? Yeah, absolutely. He does bad at that crown jewel. Not only is it bad on his personal performance because he's driving for a living, but it hurts him points wise for Lucas Oil Championship. So like what do you kind of think on that? Do you like these crown jewels being sanctioned or do you kind of like the older format where they were unsanctioned and it was just about go out there and, and go for the money and get the, the, the crown jewel race itself? There's There are a lot of factors that go into it um, for me to give a straight answer. Um, I, I think when the race is held has a lot to do with do I like it being sanctioned or not because if you've got – if it's, you know, a lot of the crown jewels for um, dirt late models are in the summertime, um, kind of that May through August uh, time period. So if you've got a guy that's, you know, fighting for points in the World Outlaw side of things and he and Lucas Oles having to show me 100 this weekend, um, you know, he, he might contemplate even going because if he take obviously he, he wants to run his primary car if he's going – because that's you know to be had the best chance at winning, but if he tears it up now he's you know screwed out of his world outlaw side of things, um, and you see that a lot. You know guys will contemplate, uh, or even if they do show up and they you know have bad luck in the heat and have to run a B main, they'll scratch from the show because they don't want to tear up their car. Um, so, and those kind of instances. I think location has a lot to do with it as well. Um, you know, show me 100s right in the middle of the state, you know, right there, um, Missouri area. And so it, even if we're outlaw guys don't show up, I have enough locals that'll come show and I'll have, you know, 50 cars and I'll be fine. You know, the very early and end of the years, um, I think that's when, you know, the not being sanctioned really plays a big role into it. Another thing with the sanctioning stuff is uh, you got to have rules. You know, you have to have rules that to is, follow. That's true. Too. So if you if you just put on this unsanctioned show, um, this isn't a crown jewel, but just uh, something for us locally, um, 311s, you know, running a 10,000 win race here at the end of October. And it's technically unsanctioned. I know the the Schaefer Oil deal, the Fall Nationals are doing it. But before the Schaefer Oil started on it, they said they were going to run Lucas Oil rules so it's not a lucas oil race but they're just following the same rules so you have to have something in place for you can't just say unsanctioned and then run what you're wrong because you know you got guys that are running one a car with a droop not with a droop you know different things like that um the uh a good point uh the virginia race uh the usa 100 um it it has switched from world outlaws to lucas oil and when those two guys had it you maybe have 30 35 cars they go to ultimate which is more of a regional uh sanctioning body and they get 40 plus because these guys that was the the craziest thing you'd have thought the national thing would have got it sure but going to a regional sanction they drew more and 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 they still got bloomquist and Earl Pearson and some of them did come out there. The big and the big reason in behind having more cars on that is, and I think this is where I don't like it being sanctioned is if it's an outlaw or a Lucas Oil sanctioned show. There's provisionals, so your local guy knows I'm really only fighting for a handful of spots here. Versus if there's no provisionals, then you know one through twenty four, twenty six, twenty eight, however many they start are open to me. But you know Davenport, your points leader goes in there and he doesn't make it through a heat and a B. Well, he still gets to start the show because he's a tour regular. You know, and I, I there's two sides of that. It's not fair to the local guy because you know he may not be in a position where he can chase the tour, but it's not fair to Davenport either because he made that commitment. You know. Um, the National 100, it was uh, down in Alabama. It was sanctioned for years. Uh, they went to unsanctioned, and car count hurt on that one. So that's one of those rare ones where it kind of hurt a little more. Um, so uh, it, there's pros and cons to both of it. Um, if it's, I love the end of the year. Um, this past weekend was great because World Outlaws and Luxor was off, and there's big paying shows. You know, you got 10,000 at Sonoya. You had 20,000 at uh, the Cotton Picking 100 in Mississippi. And you don't know who's going to show up. Yeah. And, that, and, and as a fan, I used to love that. You know, now I can go on Dirt on Dirt and see who's going to show up this weekend. But I used to love just going to the, sitting in the stands and when those cars start rolling out for hot laps, you had no clue who's going to be there. I'm like, oh man, you know, Bloomquist is here or Madden's here, you know, whoever. 
and that made you excited and that I like that aspect of it um, on these unsanctioned shows you have no clue who's going to show up and but I think they fit better at the end of the year because in the middle of the year the guys who run the tours are running for points so they have to keep that in mind it also one big dynamic that goes between the late model stuff and the sprint stuff and I know I'm gonna I'm gonna hang on the dirt just because I'm just a fan. You also have the dichotomy of on the late model side, you have two national touring series. You have World Outlaws and you have Lucas Oil. For a while, you had a third, and then it went away. On the sprint car side, World Outlaws is the only national tour. You have other regional tours like All Star Circuit. You have uh, you know a bunch of these kind of little regional ones, but there's one national tour. Mm -hmm. So that kind of throws an interesting kind of dynamic to it because like you said on the late model side if it's world outlaw sanction you know you're going to get just to name a few you're going to get brandon shepherd daryl lanigan uh you're going to get those guys that they pay mm -hmm. show up money mm -hmm. whereas if you go lucas Oil sanctioning you're going to get davenport bloomquist jimmy owens uh earl pearson and the guys that they pay to show up at every single race so that you know throws a little interesting wrench into it all but uh i don't I forgot on this one. The two crown jewels at Eldora, the the the, the World One Hundred and a Dream. Mm -hmm. They're UMP. Right. That's not that's that's the comp World Outlaws owns that company, but they're not. There's no yeah. There's no World Outlaw points. Right. Or anything like that. Right. Yeah. They are UMP, and and no one really follows UMP points. Um. So that that's one of those rare instances where it works to have the sanctioning, but nobody is nobody gets a provisional. Um. You know. It, it's more open, so anybody can make the show. Uh, yeah. But it is sanctioned, so you have officials there who know the rule book, who um, you know they, they have experience and can handle a hundred race cars in the pit area. Um, you know, versus if you just went unsanctioned, you'd have to get a bunch of volunteers and you have to get everybody on the same page, and you would still have to adopt some sort of rule book or rule package uh, for everybody to follow. Yeah, another thing I'll throw in on the asphalt side as far as the late model stock goes the super stuff i kind of i like where it's at there's a lot of unique stuff probably the most unique crown jewel i could think of is it's one in anderson indiana it's called the red bud 400 and just in my research for doing this is a 400 lab super late model race around a quarter mile yeah and obviously it's a quarter mile there's not enough parking spots in the infield so they do the pit stops in the infield i just thought that was really unique but on the asphalt late model side one thing I can bang, I, I kind of bang on is most most of the ones I named are NASCAR sanctioned. Okay, NASCAR's top priority is not the All American Series, the late models. Their top priority is obviously Cup and the mm -hmm. old Bush Series and the Truck Series and stuff. Whereas on dirt, this is what you know. This is their their top thing. All right. There's no higher level. All right. But so hey. I enjoy them. I just, I just hope the ticket is thirty dollars or less. That's usually what I'll cap it at thirty bucks, unless it's like World Finals, then I'll skew some money and whatnot. But well, you got to remember that purse has got to come out of somebody's pocket. So, well, here's here's one <laughs> for just the races you've been to in person. Okay. Best memory from a crown jewel that you have been to. Oh, I'll, I'll give one of mine, but I'll put you on the spot first, man. Because we're in your house, uh, <laughs> recording this. Best memory you've had from a crown jewel or big kind of event that you've been to Man. in person. I don't know if I can just pick one. Um, I was just a few that come to mind. Um, first time being in the pits at Eldora, um, we moved around a little bit, and um, all it was great. It was Five dollars, and you got pit passes for the whole weekend. It was just ridiculous. But uh, standing in turns three and four. On the fence. I mean, I I got my the camera my on my phone. Just I got my arm through the fence, and these dudes come by, and it just it sucks your shirt in when they come by, and you feel like you can give them a high five. I mean, you are on top of them, um, and you watch them on TV, and and even from the stands. I mean, you know they're moving pretty good, but there's just nothing like when they just zip by you sideways on dirt, three wide, you know, hundred plus in the corner. That 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 was quite a just a awe inspiring. Um, moment um going to florence uh, and getting to see the hall of fame uh that was really big because of all the just the history there and you know and it's it's not like a any other sport hall of fame you know this is a 10 building and they just got a bunch of stuff up there but uh just going through and seeing all the old names and 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 where the sport had come from um that that was pretty pretty um just the education side of me really enjoyed that um uh, 
man, uh, Mansfield. I mean, just a beautiful, I mean, I was a former um, uh, asphalt track, but it's just a beautiful facility and just the way everything was lit and, and had nice bathrooms and, and concession stuff, which is hard to press in the dirt world. Um, that, that, those are the few that just come to mind to start with. Yeah, I've, I've got kind of twofold. One is kind of a childhood memory of going, we used to go to both late model races that Martinsville had, the spring and the fall one, before they condensed it to just the fall one. And I remember going in the spring, and, and, and gosh, it was always so hot. I mean, we'd, we'd be out there. This was early 90s. So most of these men are not only shirtless, but they are short-shorted. <laughs> yes. So it's just, I mean, my uncle was one of them standing there. <laughs> Me and my grandma getting and burnt to a crisp. But there's 130 cars. They got, I think they would lock in the top 15, top 20. The heat races, there would be four heat races. Top five from each one would get in. And we were talking about this before we hit the record button. I mean, they were just they would beat the snot out of each other for that last transfer spot. No way. And I mean, it was just it was unbelievable to see 130 late models in Martinsville. And then most recently, my favorite one was I got to be on the broadcast for that old North State Nationals 30,000 win car store race at Orange County, and the two guys that were up front battling at the end were two late model guys. It was Lee Pulliam, who's won multiple national championships. Um, and then Josh Berry, who drives a late model for Dale Jr., but doesn't have the money. He's Jr.'s gotten him a couple rides in Xfinity, but he doesn't have the money connections to run that. So he he's I consider Josh Berry a late model guy. And the fact that that race came down to two late model guys, I just enjoyed. And they put on a it was an, it was a great show. You know, Pulliam gets out in victory lane. He's like, yeah, I wasn't going to let him use me up. I was going to get him back. And it was just, it was just good racing. Yeah. And it wasn't that thing that everybody talks about, like some, some person coming in from the outside who's only in a late model for a short period of time. It right. was two guys that are just late model guys. So that would be kind of in my favor. Yeah. But like I told you in the intro, we ain't going to argue and fuss and cuss <laughs> and hot take each other to death. That's right. So we'll switch to something a little more lighthearted. Okay. You and I have known each other for... God, way too many years. Now yes. we're in our 30s. And both God-fearing Christians in church on a regular basis came up Baptist. You came up a little more Baptist than I did because <laughs> you got it at the house as well. Oh, yes. And we always get to talking about just these kind of funny, crazy things that happen either in church or with you when you was with the gospel quartet running sound. And it's just, you know, you know church is a holy place and right. we're there to worship God and that's first and foremost. But sometimes funny stuff just happens. I thought we maybe we could share a, something a little funny. I, I'll give you my example so you'll know kind of where to go with this. I think it was 2002 or 2003. It was a Bible Baptist church where you and I went as, as kids. And homecoming, they would always bring in a gospel group. And this one year, they brought in a group called the Harvesters. And it was uh, four or five guys up there, and one guy was singing, a, 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 playing a piano. They would They did a set. It was a long set. Of course, about five altar calls in the middle of that set. That's right. That's right. We go and eat because we're Baptist and we, we're going to eat. Absolutely. That's why he showed up. <laughs> and, um, we come back out and they're, they're going to sing some more. And the lead singer, somewhere in between the sets, someone gave him some chewing gum or he had some. And I guess he forgot to spit it out before he came back up on the stage. And in the middle of one of the songs, I mean, the spirit just hit him. And that piece of chewing gum went flying out of his mouth in the third row. And I, was just, I mean, you had to laugh. You yeah. couldn't take it so seriously. I was just like, who knew the lead singer? Because the lead singer in the gospel quartet, I mean, my man is hitting the high notes. He is, right. He's got the old women tearing up the cleaners. And my man sent some bazooka flying into the third row on the chewing gum. I, I remember that. And I remember they, they played a, a faster song. And the uh, uh, singer, there was like a little interlude in there. It was all music, and the singer like did like a little dance thing. Um, you know, you sure he was allowed to dance? That's a bad He's so, so it was, Yeah, but he he moved his feet swiftly. We'll put it that way. There you go. And uh, uh, Zach Albright, we were sitting on the front row. All those kids sitting on the front row. And Zach Albright just jaw dropped. He loved it. And they got done <laughs> singing a couple more songs, and they took a break. And Zach, who didn't really speak out a whole lot, he raised his hand. And the lead singer like noticed him. He said, "Can y'all sing that song where he danced again? I want to see that again." And it was like a hush 
<laughs> on the crowd because uh, you know that that song had a little bit quicker tempo than four four time and so they were all about it or weren't all about it excuse me but i just remember that it was just like a hush came across the crowd you're gonna ask that man to dance exactly, <laughs> exactly. that's the d word in baptist church right there well see it was that was one of the things that held me and allison from getting married to baptist church because we knew we could not dance yeah, in the reception right, hall right. and i was like man i gotta have the first dance with my yeah, wife that's right you gotta yeah. have the cha-cha slide you gotta have the cupid <laughs> shuffle you gotta that's have right. the electric all, all the songs that white it, it, people it, it, can dance right. to where the, they the ones where they tell you the moves yeah that's exactly right. that's right but no there's there's a there's so much stuff funny that happens in church I just, oh yeah boy. i think well the season is quickly upon us but the uh the christmas play you always had some good good times in all the christmas plays and your sister fussed at me yeah. for one. i'm gonna tell the story so we had this one christmas play that we were all in buddy's sister at the time you know girls mature faster than guys do, so she was taller than all of us and she had the longest blonde hair and she was the only i think she was the only female in the group well Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay might probably. have been there but so we were doing this thing where we had everybody lined up and everybody had a candle. And I guess the point of the song was passing the flame down the aisle. Take, was, take your candle and light the world. Yeah, take yep. your candle and light the world. That's right. And I kept laughing because Zach Albright had a part where he was trying to light his candle with a with a cigarette lighter. And the theme was supposed to be like, he's trying to light it, but it won't light. Yep. And when we were up on stage, he got it to light and somebody blew it out. And when we were practicing, I would just get to snickering and laughing. <laughs> and Paula Payne Hornaday, God bless her heart, turned to me in practice and said, if you can't keep a straight face, you don't need to be on stage. Yes. And I was scared to death. <laughs> and everybody else was about to Welcome laugh. Welcome to my upbringing, Tyler. Oh, God. Welcome to my upbringing. My, my favorite, um, for, a long, for a long time, Mom did all the Christmas play stuff and uh, the music. And we had, like... I, they would do like the cantata thing where it's just singing and then every like other year or something like that they do a play and it was the same play every year but um i never I, realized that it was the same like for the longest time it was the exact same play every year and i mean you memorize your lines once and you're good for a 10 year span but um i'll, I'll leave names out of it but one of the uh, older gentlemen at the church at the time he was a wise man and his only line in the whole thing was uh frankincense i have to bring where the, the wise man presenting the, yeah. the gifts that it was his only line and and i can see where this is going <laughs> he was struggling he was struggling and uh when, when it got time when it got the go time he comes up and he, and he didn't like being on the, on the stage the crowd looking at him and instead of frankenstein he said frankenstein he said frankenstein <laughs> i have to bring to you and we just kind of played all through it but i'm like having the I'm over here in the corner with mom, and she's like gripping my arm. Both of us try not to laugh. That was a pretty good one. <laughs> Frankenstein. Frankenstein have I, I to bring. Yes. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. See, I remember one. There was, when I was growing up, I went to Bethel Baptist, and there was one year where I was a wise man. And our only instruction, we didn't have lines, but our only instruction was one of you is going, it sounds like a football play. One of you is going up the middle, the other two are going up the sides. Yeah. And we each had something in our hand to bring, you know, to the scene. And then we were going to pray and that was going to be the end of the Christmas play. Well, I'm over on the right. Whoever else is on the left. I forget who is in the middle. And I think he had, he had a jar or something. And we got about halfway up the aisle. And I don't know whose cane he tripped over or if it was the carpet come up. My man ate it. And he just slipped and fell and just dropped it. And he kind of like had that freak out face that kids have. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to get up or what. And one of the adults had to go out in the aisle and be like, okay, you can stand up. Yeah. We got to the altar. Fake baby Jesus is in the manger. And, and we go to pray at the end of it. And uh, it was a girl, I, I don't know if she was Mary or who she was, and she kept winking at me. <laughs> and I was just like, man, I was like six or seven. I was like, man, we got to be professional up here. We yeah. can't be winking at me in the Christmas play. <laughs> I probably flattered myself way too much. She probably. The original Christian Mingle right there. Exactly. Christian <laughs> Mingle. <laughs> uh, I think we'll cut it off there. I pray and pray and pray I will get a hold of you more often. Absolutely. When your heating and air conditioning, <laughs> yes. hair care, entire season comes, that's right, that's right. slows down a tick before the winter comes, and then they'll be back on when the heaters go that's out. That's right. That's right. But, man, we'll be around. I was about to say. I love, I love being with you. We, 
we could talk for two hours and not repeat the same thing, but we had to structure it for this. But uh, I appreciate it, brother. Absolutely, man. All right. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Episode three of the Half Price Concessions podcast with me, Tyler Williams, and my good friend, Buddy Payne. Thank you for listening. And we got more episodes coming up in the coming weeks. We try to get out at least one a week, one every other week. But stay tuned to this page. We'll be putting out more episodes, no doubt. Have a good one, and God bless.